Good evening, I'm Leland Bitter. There are stories pouring in from schools and school board meetings across the nation showing violent outbursts and straight up insanity on both sides of the COVID vaccine and mask mandate debates. We start with the race against time and the Taliban to get Americans trapped in Afghanistan home before U.S. troops leave. For the first time, the Secretary of State gave a hard number for the number of Americans wanting to get out before the August 31st deadline to withdraw troops. Over the past 24 hours, we've been in direct contact with approximately 500 additional Americans and provided specific instructions on how to get to the airport safely. But getting to the Kabul airport is somewhere between impossible and incredibly dangerous. Once there, thousands crowd into a sewage canal to show their papers in the hopes of getting hoisted up by American troops. These aren't pictures of that. We have those pictures. We'll bring them to you in a minute. We're covering all angles, as always. Holly McKay continues her amazing reporting on the situation in Kabul at this hour and tells us about the new fighters trying to take on the Taliban. Jason Beardsley spent decades as a Green Beret, and he's going to tell us about the secret CIA and U.S. military operations to rescue some, emphasis some, Americans. But we start with Senator Joni Ernst, Republican from Iowa, served in the military for over 23 years as a company commander in Kuwait and Iraq during Iraqi Freedom Center. We appreciate it, as always. Well, you listen to the administration today, and they seem to say everything's fine. We've got this under control. We're going to meet the deadline. We're going to get Americans out. What is there to possibly worry about? Oh, Leland, um, we could go on and on and on. This is a debacle of enormous proportions. My greatest fear is that we will leave Americans behind in Afghanistan with no way to exit and a very brutal, brutal Taliban on their heels. Um, so we are not able to discern what the numbers of Americans are at this time. I've heard two different numbers coming from the administration today. One was 4,100, which was briefed to those House members earlier in the day. Uh, with a correction that came out later from the State Department saying, oh, no, 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 there's only roughly a thousand or less Americans in Afghanistan. This hmm. is, uh, again, such a debacle, Leland, and I am so afraid that with these um, inconsistencies between the departments that we are going to leave American citizens behind. So come August 31st, it seems as though there's a pretty simple choice, and you don't have to listen to the administration for that. You listen to the Taliban. They say there's going to be consequences, and Americans must leave by August 31st. You were in uniform. If the commander-in-chief gives the order to stay, there's going to be a lot of American lives at risk at the airport that's surrounded. Uh, would you be in favor of using force to stay past August 31st? Yes, if that means that we are moving out Americans and getting them to safety, I think that that is imperative. Um, we should be leaving no one behind, whether it's an American citizen, whether it is someone that we have made promises to, such as those interpreters, those that have worked for our embassy, those that have stood by our men and women in uniform over the past 20 years of the global war on terrorism. We need to stay. And unfortunately, of course, we only have a few days to get Americans out according to the Taliban deadline. And yet the State Department has issued yet another warning right. telling American citizens not to come to the airport. How can we evacuate them if they're not allowed to move to the airport? We're going to get into that in a minute. But you mentioned the American allies, the Afghan translators and other people who risk their life for America that we owe a, a real debt of honor to. And I'm glad you did, because part of the right wing media and especially the MAGA movement has been questioning your conservative bona fides for coming to their aid and for advocating for bringing them uh, to America. Here was Tucker Carlson on Fox News a couple of days ago. Take a listen. I watched Joni Ernst say that. We welcome them, really, to your house, to your neighborhood? I don't think so. To some sad little town with no power whatsoever. No one will ever go five years from now to see how it's going. I don't know if you can see on the screen, but we'll put it back up. When the bar below you, they chironed you, R question mark, uh, as if you're something less of a Republican for wanting America to keep their promises. Uh, I found it personally offensive. I'm wondering your thoughts. 
Well, I don't question who I am and what I stand for. The fact of the matter is that these interpreters, those that worked alongside our government, especially the men and women in uniform in Afghanistan, many of them willing to take a bullet for these men and women, these great Americans who stood up, put our uniform on, where's the flag of our country? The fact that these people in Afghanistan cared so much for our members of the military, uh, the fact that they stood by us through 20 years of the global war on terror, I think they have earned entry into the United States. Yeah. And yes, as Iowans, we would welcome them into our communities. They love America. They are hard workers. They are willing to sacrifice a lot for the United States of America. I think we owe them a grat uh, debt of gratitude. Debt of gratitude, debt of honor. We, we said it earlier, they're standing in sewage canals. Uh, they're so scared of the Taliban to try to get out. Senator, we appreciate it and uh, appreciate that perspective. Um, it's one that I think is really important for the American people to hear. Thank you, ma'am. Oh, thank you so much, Leland. All right. Right now it's about 4.30 in the morning in Kabul and desperate Americans are trying to reach the airport to evacuate. And as the Senator just said, we're learning the U.S. Embassy is telling them not to go there. A new alert is citing security threats outside the gate. Joining us now to talk about this, Jason Beardsley, retired Green Beret and the executive director of the Association of the U.S. Navy. Good to see you as always, sir. We appreciate it. Uh, this is what we were worried about, right? Uh, terrorists taking pot shots at us. Right. This is a disaster. It's an abomination. It's going to go down in the annals of history uh, as one of our historic uh, flaws. And we've seen this play before. So S President Biden was once a senator when we lost an embassy in Tehran in Islamabad. He was there under Nairobi and Dar es Salaam. He was there again when we saw our uh, embassy uh, retrograded out of Sana'a, Yemen, and of course our diplomatic mission in Benghazi. So they should have known this was coming. There was a suggestion that the adults have entered the room, but if these are the adults, then we need a new set of leaderships because this has been horrifically botched. I'm just, particularly though, to what we have going on on the ground right now, it seems as though you've got 6,000 American troops, a lot of planes going in and out, quite literally surrounded by terrorists. And the U.S. administration says they can get all these 500 Americans out in six days. Something about those set of facts don't seem to line up. There's a lot of facts here that have been clouded. Uh, we've heard from a lot of spokesmen. It looks like the State Department is running lead on this. This is a military operation. There are men and women on the ground doing heroic work to do non-combatant evacuation operations, and they do that well. But when we put the military mission in the hands of the diplomats, you can look for this kind of a disaster just to receive that message. Imagine if you're an American or, or you're one of our interpreters, and you get that message as you're standing by the gate with your life threatened, and it says to go back because there may be some more attacks. Well, this you, is a disaster. Yeah, and you, and you risked your life for good leadership. You risked your life trying to get to the airport, and you know that if you don't get on a plane in six days, you're likely uh, either going to be a hostage uh, or be killed. Uh, real quick, uh, Admiral Kirby, Mr. Kirby at the Pentagon podium earlier today. Take a listen. How many individuals on terror watch lists have been screened or found at any of the screening points, either in Qatar, Ramstein, or in the U.S.? Uh, I, I don't know. Uh, we'll have to take that question and, uh, and get back to you. Truth of the matter is, is we're evacuating a lot of people who deservedly need to get out, but you have to think there's probably a couple of people that the Taliban snuck in there, right? Right. Listen, bad leadership is all over this thing, including who we're bringing into the United States or who are refugees. We have a process in place whereby we screen them, my organization, Association of the United States Navy, wrote a letter to the White House along with other veteran service organizations telling them that they had to get this done before the evacuation. We never heard back from the White House. From the front to the back, this thing is a disaster. So we can look for more of that in the upcoming days and weeks, maybe even months. But this should have been handled by smart military leadership. Yeah. You have to know whether they got bad advice and took it or whether uh, the White House just ignored the advice. One of the two. Uh, always good to see you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Afghanistan itself is roughly the size of Texas, but it's the population of California. It's almost entirely controlled by the Taliban. We want to come over here to the map wall to show you how much the Taliban controls. Obviously that they've got Kabul right here. This map is a couple of days old. This is the area we want to focus in on. You can see the entire country 
is filled with roads that have checkpoints of Taliban gunmen, bands of terrorists blocking the roads. This pocket of resistance right here, we're going to flip the map one more time and show you where the son of a famed Afghan warlord is now organizing an army against the Taliban. It's this area just north of Kabul going over here towards the border. The problem is, is that the resistance fighters, the Northern Alliance, are largely landlocked and cut off. Holly McKay, an independent journalist, has been joining us about this time most nights, reporting from just over the border. Holly, you spent some time with these Northern Alliance fighters. Do they have a shot? Well, they definitely have a shot in keeping uh, Pangaea protected. I don't see that uh, falling anytime soon. Uh, the, the area is extremely uh, fortified. They have a lot of fighters there that are extremely dedicated, a lot of former Mujahideen, uh, so very experienced in the battlefield. And, and, uh, and I've spent you know, different periods of time with them over the years, and they're definitely um, you know, extremely determined, if you will, that, that that part of the country will never be. And it's really so clearly who, it's Holly, the who exactly, the country. We, we've got some pictures to put up of these fighters that you that you sent in and spent time with. Who are they? One One's the son of sort of an Afghan warlord from the 90s, right? Right. So uh, Ahmed Massoud, uh, he's the son of a, what they call the Lion of Pangaea, which his father, Ahmed Shah Massoud, and he was a very strong ally to the United States. And he was actually killed by Al-Qaeda two days before 9-11, very strategically, because he would have been sort of a natural leader or a natural ally uh, to the U.S., uh, after 9-11, so uh, Al-Qaeda was very careful in taking him out. However, his son, uh, who's been trained in, in, in Britain, and, and uh, he is commanding now, I believe, 6,000 or more uh, troops in the wow. area to really protect them. And he was offered by the Taliban in the last couple of days to take one of the, the 12, uh, quote, unquote, uh, transitional government uh, positions, and he refused. Huh. So he really is not, uh, not willing to, I think, willing to negotiate, nope. but not willing to... Yeah, noteworthy that the U.S. seems to be very quiet in terms of whether we're helping him or not. We understand the British gave them uh, a lot of training over the past couple of years. Real quick before we let you go, your reporting about what's happening in Kabul has been nothing short of exceptional. The administration says things are getting better and the people who need to get out are. Does that jive with your reporting? I'm hearing more stories about people having success in, in finally getting through after many days. But what concerns me right now is that sort of the window will potentially remain open for Americans, but it's the Afghan Americans or it's the Afghans who have helped us that are really just being turned away. Uh, yesterday, a friend of mine who had been tracking for five days straight, a man who was in a wheelchair with his five kids, a former interpreter, and for he, he still could not get to the gate. He got there eventually, the Taliban have turned him away and said, absolutely not. So that's what really concerns me. Um, I think over the next few days, we will hopefully be seeing more Americans being able to leave. But uh, my, my thoughts are really with the Afghans who supported us throughout this conflict that are, are really losing in the time battle. Yeah, you can see the desperation grow on people's faces outside the gates. Holly, thank you very much. Thanks for getting up early to be with us. Well, thank you. All right. Back to Afghanistan in a few minutes and as events warrant. But we want to tell you about how the penalties for the unvaccinated are increasing by the day. First, we're going to talk to you about a Texas hospital, DFW Hospital in Dallas. They're short on ICU beds right now, and they've discussed prioritizing vaccinated patients, making it so the unvaccinated may not be able to find a hospital bed. State officials in Texas say most ICU beds are filled with COVID-19 patients, and there's no room for any more. Please don't get on a motorcycle, don't have a trauma, don't have a heart attack, because we're gonna be at a point where we can't manage you. Scary, scary warning. Hospital officials confirm the discussions about prioritizing vaccinated patients who come in the door, but say so far their guidelines and their protocols have not changed. We'll keep you updated. Up next, the nation's largest airline is slamming down another punishment for the unvaccinated. Delta Airlines says it's going to charge $200 a month in surcharge of insurance premiums for unvaccinated employees. Only applies to employees, but you can imagine that it wouldn't be hard to see this expanding, perhaps. Delta also plans to limit sick time for those who do not get the vaccine. Delta is the first large corporation to use insurance charges to increase its workforce vaccination rates. I have to wonder and think about what happened when companies increased their insurance rates for tobacco use. That 
didn't really change things much. We'll see if this does. The pressure to favor the vaccinated is also on smaller employers. Tyler Hollinger is the owner of Festival Cafe in New York. He's been forced to police vaccine compliance. And Tyler, uh, even the performers in the restaurant business don't look very good. I can imagine having to have two or three employees at the door checking COVID cards uh, doesn't help the bottom line. Leland, thanks so much for having me back on this show. You know, here at Festival Cafe on the Upper East Side, 61st and 2nd Avenue, we're doing something revolutionary and unique. Not only are we uh, allowing people to check, self check in with QR codes, but we have three different seating options. We got indoor, we got outdoor, we got private seating chalets, which is what I'm coming from you live. This is on the sidewalk. That's, that's pretty incredible, but again, all pretty expensive, right? It's incredibly expensive, and let me tell you who is not helping us pay the bills, the city of New York. In fact, the city of New York has sent their thugs from the Department of Transportation to fine us for these ticky-tacky violations. So according to Mayor de Blasio, the unvaccinated can't sit inside, and the unvaccinated can't sit outside. I just want to understand this. So you're checking QR codes for people who have the vaccine. You're saying that unvaccinated folks can sit, sit outside, but you're still getting fined by who and what are the fines? Yeah, the Department of Transportation just came yesterday threatening $1,000 a day fines for, for some really minor compliance issues. When I explained to the gentleman that he was wrong and I showed him certificates and permits, he didn't care because let me tell you something, the city of New York is broke and they want their money. Does, does this make sense to you? They, may, they want their money, but they're also trying to crack down on businesses that are paying taxes? This makes absolutely no sense, and it's the worst public policy decision de Blasio has made to date. And let me tell you, he's made a lot of bad decisions. <laughs> so first off, if you're unvaccinated, you're just not going to go inside to a bar. You're going to sit outside. You're going to sit in one of these private chalets. Well, let me tell you one thing. You're not going to go and get vaccinated because of it. If the city's real goal was to get everyone vaccinated, they would make you get a vaccine before you got on the subway. But the city doesn't want to police that. Huh. They want to put the burden on small business because they want to find small business as a revenue generating potential. It's oh. disgusting. Oh, fascinating thought and perspective, especially when you say that the subway rules would really change things. Uh, Tyler, as always, we appreciate uh, the thoughts, the perspective. Keep at it. I know it's hard work being a small business owner, and we'll see you the next time we're in New York. Absolutely. I'm going to save a seat for you at the bar. All right. Looking forward to it. The teacher was bleeding, had some lacerations to his face, had some bruising on his face, um, pretty good size knot on the back of his head. Teachers are becoming the pawns in the debate over masks at schools. We're going to talk to one superintendent about the violence in her district. But first, a conversation with the mayor of an Arizona border town about how the ban on non-essential travel is crushing his economy. As we've reported so many times, America's southern border is open for illegal immigration, but legal travel across the border remains banned. The DHS has extended its ban for another month due to COVID. So crossing the border for what they deem non-essential reasons like shopping, well, it's not allowed. And the ban is crippling businesses in border towns and cities that depend on shoppers. Joining us now, one border city mayor is fed up with all of this, the mayor of Nogales, Arizona, Arturo Garino. Mayor, we appreciate you being with us. This has got to be a double whammy for you guys. Hey, first of all, thank you very much for inviting me. Yes, it is. And, and it's uh, something that I think uh, uh, has gone too far. Well, uh, tell me, tell me what it means. So, so stores they are closing, businesses are shutting down because customers can't come over? Yes. First of all, they closed the downtown area because we have a, a port of entry that's uh, only for pedestrian walk, it's a pedestrian walkway. That's been closed for months. So the, the first two blocks of Nogales in the downtown area basically was abandoned. A lot of the stores were closed for a long time. Now a lot of the stores have taken their merchandise out because they no longer can stay open. So they're basically a lot of them are vacant buildings that we're gonna have to reinvent ourselves to uh, maybe one day open. But it's, it's unbelievable. 
It's got to just be destroying that. The administration does not have their priorities straight. It, it's got to just be destroying also the, the tax base and the economy down there and everybody who works in the stores. Are you having the same problem that Texas border towns are with being overrun with illegal immigrants rather than legal ones? You know, at, within the city limits, no, but east and west of here, yes. In the Salsa Bay area and uh, to, going towards Cochis County, yes, there's a, a, a lot of them coming across. They're not coming in through the city of Nogales, but uh, um, uh, what we need here is the opportunity for these people that do have legal documents and, and want to conduct business legally through our ports of entry that are not being allowed. I just want to make sure I get across. this right. I just want to make sure I get this right, and I'm smiling because it, it seems sort of bizarre what you're describing, but I want to make sure I get it right. If you want to walk across the border legally or illegally, just go 10 or 15 miles either side of the, your city, you can walk across no problem into the country. But if you want to come across legally and buy stuff in a store in Nogales and provide money to the U.S. economy, you can't do it. You can't. You can't. There's, uh, they won't allow you uh, uh, because you're considered non-essential. And, and uh, <clears throat> everybody in town here and in in this county, you know, we're the highest in the whole state of Arizona that has been vaccinated. We're close to about 95 97 percent of the city and the county vaccinated so they they claim it's COVID. i really don't think it is I have think you it's talked to anybody political. in the administration mayor and tried to get this changed or get an exemption i've sent letters to our congressmen our senators our state representatives and washington to the vice president and not one response not a letter not a call not an email nothing in regards to this issue I wish I could say I was surprised by you not getting a response, but I'm not. Uh, where, do you, where do you go from here? At, at some point, how do you stop the bleeding of the economy of your town? Well, you know, we've gotten, uh, uh, with the pre previous administration, the Trump administration, last year we received $2.3 million, which kept us afloat and we balanced our budget. Uh, at that, very close to that time, we were about to start laying employees off. This administration gave us some money, too, again uh, for this year but you know what we can't live with with uh, handouts from any administration we need to be able to conduct our business with the floating population that we have daily of, uh, from anywhere from 10 to fifty thousand dollars fifty thousand persons coming across daily uh, and during the peak season up to a hundred thousand people we're two months away from our peak se season the best season that we have is from october to february our comparisons report comes out in February. I don't see it uh, doing uh, well if this administration wow. continues to leave this border closed. But you know, uh, I am sick and tired. Uh, I already told my, my council last council meeting that I will not write another resolution, another letter to this administration because it seems like they don't listen, they don't wanna respond. I honestly believe we're being treated like second class citizens. Well, and, and all you want to do is be able to open your city up so people can have businesses and thrive and pay their taxes. Mayor, uh, if you ever do get a response, let us know, and uh, we'll have you back on to talk about it, sir. I, I would love to, but, uh, you know, and, and, and that's why I want to thank you for allowing, this, allowing me to be here because this message needs to go out there, and, and, uh, and I hope somebody is listening to this uh, in Washington because uh, uh, our senators... Both senators, uh, no help. Kelly and Cinema, they know about it. Our Congressman Grijalva knows about it. They got letters. Hmm. Uh, matter of fact, the only one. Well, you know what, kind of, listen you know, Mayor, to I me hate, and I talk I hate to, to run, but we'll put out some requests to them and see if they'll come on and talk about this. We'll play them some of your sound and see what they have to say. Thank you. Thank you, Lena, very much. All Thank right. you. Good to see you. It's rare in Washington, but right now, lawmakers in the United <clears throat> are united on their stance on the Afghanistan withdrawal. We're talking to both sides about what they agree on and what they don't when we come back. Why haven't we heard the president say the United States does not negotiate with terrorists? Is that still the U.S. policy? Well, of course it is, Peter, but I would also say that uh, there's a reality that the Taliban is currently controlling large swaths of Afghanistan. Uh, that is a reality on the ground. 
Has the, U the U.S. offered the Taliban anything in terms of cash or supplies uh, to help facilitate this coordination? No, this is not a quote, quid pro quo. Uh, we have uh, laid out clearly what our expectations are about moving American citizens and our Afghan uh, partners, allies, out of the country, and that's what we are working to deliver on. The White House continues to take tough questions regarding the Biden administration's dealings with the Taliban and who is actually running the show on the ground. The Taliban is, and our troops are surrounded right now at the airport. This is bringing a rare moment of bipartisanship on Capitol Hill right now, which is the, taking the White House to the woodshed on the chaotic withdrawal. We're going to get reaction from both sides of the aisle. In a moment, we're going to hear from Republican Congressman Mark Green, first the Democratic side, Congressman Jake Auchincloss, retired Marine who commanded an infantry unit in Afghanistan. Congressman, we appreciate you joining us. Thank you. Um, I read your op-ed in the Washington Post today. I know you are in favor of the withdrawal and the decision to get out. Are you okay with how that decision has been executed? No withdrawal from a country whose moniker is the graveyard of empires is, is going to be a ticker tape parade. This was always going to be rocky. But the United States military has brought order to chaos and done what it's done, what it, what it always does best. Uh, it is evacuating 1,000 people an hour. We will get all the Americans who want to get out out by August 31st, and they have security in hand at the airport. That does not mean it's not a highly risky situation. It absolutely is. But after a very hard first 24 hours at HKIA, uh, the U.S. military uh, is evacuating people at a rapid clip. This is one of the most impressive airlift operations in history. No question there's no greater force for good in the world than the United States military. But aside from one or two helicopter missions a couple of hundred yards from the airport, the military is confined to the airport uh, because of Bi Biden administration orders. They take orders, and I know you did uh, know that better than anybody as a Marine. Should there have been better planning to prevent the disaster that we saw of, of you know, 24 hours of chaos and people falling from planes? There's going to be a robust after action review, uh, but there is no seamless way to leave a country of 30 million people that's being taken over by a regime like the Taliban. This president came into office facing a wrenching decision. He could either go big or go home. He could surge tens of thousands of more troops to prepare for a third decade of conflict in the height of the Taliban fighting season, or he could hand Afghanistan over to the Afghans. And he made the high integrity decision to call an end to counterinsurgency. This is what winding down a two decade war is gonna look like. Yeah, it's been said there's no elegant way to lose a war, especially a 20 year war. I, I know Congressman Green's coming up on the other side, and he's going to say, oh, no, there was a third option where you could have kept five or 10,000 U.S. troops on the ground, continued to support the Afghan military with helicopter and with close air support and with military contractors, continued to supply them. That would have kept the morale up, continued to pay them. That would have kept uh, all of the grift and graft from taking over uh, the military. And we could have had a third option. And kept the Taliban from taking over. And, and, what, and what end game? That, that, that sounds like a third decade of a counterinsurgency boondoggle begun under George W. Bush and Donald Rumsfeld. For counterinsurgency to work, you've got to have a governance that can provide confidence in the rule of law, basic services, and a civil society in which combatants can beat their arms into plows. That worked in Colombia. They had a president who was a Nobel laureate, okay? The Afghan president fled at the first sign of the Taliban. This was not going to happen in Afghanistan. There was none of the ingredients of a successful counterinsurgency. In situation after room after situation room for the last two decades, smarter people than me have known that this was the first president with the integrity to tell that truth to the American people. Well, he, he has certainly stood by his decision, uh, unquestionably. Uh, Seth Moulton and uh, Representative Meyer, both veterans from opposite sides of uh, the aisle, headed over uh, to Kabul to report back and on what they call an oversight trip, and then the uh, speaker was not exactly happy. Take a listen. There's a real concern about members being in the region. This is deadly serious. We do not want members to go. I'm wondering if you thought their trip was brave or stupid or selfish. My approach to oversight and fact-finding has been to have an open line of communication with the White House uh, and to attend the classified security briefings, I think that's been the most productive way to ascertain the facts on the ground and to hold the White House and the military accountable. We need to have a 
presumptive declassification of all decision-making for the last 20 years. Congress needs to lead an investigation into how this war was waged, uh, the decisions that went in to prolonging it, and yes, how the withdrawal was executed. Well, we know the Senate uh, Armed Services Committee is going to have one Democrat controlled. And uh, when the House does, come back and talk to us about it, sir, will you? Yes. Thank you. We appreciate it. Thank you again for your service and perspective. All right. Now to the other side, the congressman from Tennessee, Mark Green, served 30 years in the Army, deployed to both Iraq and Afghanistan as a flight surgeon with the special operations teams. Congressman, uh, good to see you. We'll pick up where uh, we left off. Uh, Democrats say there really wasn't an option for a middle ground here. Are they wrong? Yeah, absolutely, Leland, and thanks for having me on. Thank you. Um, you know, counterinsurgency takes a long time. It took uh, the Brits 30 plus years in Malaysia. Look at Northern Ireland. The, the notion that uh, it's just going to be over with in just a few months or years is just, it's, that's contrary to history. Um, and the big issue here is now we've got a place that is going to be a haven of terrorists. Uh, Al Qaeda, I guess well, this is. Forgive, forgive me for interrupting. I don't think it, yeah. it's going to be. I think it already I mean, is. It, the yeah. U.S. Embassy right. just put out an alert saying any U.S. citizens who have braved their way through Taliban checkpoints uh, to get to the airport need to go home because of a terrorist yeah, threat. Absolutely. It's just going to become even more of a training ground for terrorists. Absolutely. I, I'm curious have you heard any planning among? Uh, your sources and folks you talk to who are still in the military for these contingencies that the Biden administration talks about for staying past uh, August 31st? So I know that the military is prepared to execute that mission. Uh, the, the folks that I talk to, I mean, every commander would uh, be foolish not to be. Um, and I know that the advice they're giving is to stay past August 31st. We're hearing these sort of quiet rumblings of blame the generals for this debacle uh, and that they weren't prepared, they didn't give good advice, there weren't good enough contingency plans, uh, they made the decisions, the generals, to withdraw from Bagram, et cetera. Uh, does that jive with the classified briefings you're getting? Well, obviously, I can't share what's in a classified briefing, but it doesn't jive with what's been said in the open source information. The, the leadership at the DOD has said very clearly that they advised the president to stay at Bagram. He compelled them. He pulled a number out of thin air. He wanted 600 so, you know, troops. So they went down to 600. Uh, the the uh, chairman of the Joint Chiefs said, we can't defend Bagram with 600. So, yeah, they closed it. They but it was because the president set a cap on the troops. You, arbitrarily. You, you, you've had a lot of roles in your life, uh, Ranger, doctor, flight surgeon, businessman, congressman, and uh, based on your performance yesterday, we're going to add media critic to the list. Take a listen. This president has been asked to stay in Afghanistan, to support our NATO allies who came to that country on our behalf because we were attacked. And he has said, no, we're getting out by the 31st, regardless of what you think. Now say something about that in the press. Do you think the media and by extension the American people understand what this is doing to our image around the world, both with allies and enemies? Yeah, I think so. And I, I, I was pretty emotional there after discussing the loss of some friends in Afghanistan. Um, I, I was asking them to make this point. But interestingly enough, the media has hammered Joe Biden. Uh, I, when I'm getting talking points from the New York Times, that tells you something. So I, I think the media is uh, recognizing this is a failed withdrawal, and they recognize that the blame belongs to Joe Biden. Uh, it's emotional for me, though, the issue about NATO, because, I mean, I took care of British SAS troops who were doing a joint mission with us and our nation's Tier 1 uh, unit, and um, we had four wounded guys. I took care of them. I, I did missions with these guys. For us to turn our back on them, when they're asking us to stay, they came in our aid, uh, it infuriates me. Yeah, there, there's, a, there's a lot of talk about the special relationship with the Brits not being so special anymore. Uh, oh, yeah. You're back in, in Tennessee now, I understand. Uh, 22 people died in your district because of the flooding there. It's kind of been missed uh, over the past week because of what's happening in Afghanistan. I'm, we're looking at pictures of it right now. I'm wondering your takeaways from being on the ground. 
Yeah, so I was out on Sunday right after it happened, and then I went back out there today. And, you know, Sunday was uh, the, the, the point was just the devastation and the heartbreak. Today was this unbelievable response, really, from across the country. Um, I was on the phone Monday with the, the, the leadership at Walmart. They, they showed up, um, I, I mean, all over the state of Tennessee, volunteers, four or 500 volunteers there right now. Uh, it's amazing to see um, just how Tennesseans come together to take care of one another. And that's very, very heartwarming. But there is devastation there, and the stories are just so sad. 22 people dying is stunning when you think about it. We both know the power of water, but was this predicted or was this a failure of warning? What happened? It was 17 inches of rain in basically 20 hours, which is unprecedented. Um, but the wall of water built up upstream and just came, you know, it, it, it rose literally wow. feet in just minutes. Yeah, the video is uh, stunning. Well, uh, they're glad. I know that your district's glad to have you back there advocating for them and getting some FEMA money uh, as well. Congressman, good to see you as always. Thanks, Leland. Good to see you. All right. When we come back, <laughs> you really have to see this to believe it. A Texas father strips at a local school board meeting over mask mandates. Well, we'll ask whether he made his point. We're taking a look at the many bizarre and even violent ways people are showing their frustrations over COVID restrictions. The fight over mask mandates in schools across the nation is getting next level insane from yelling and throwing punches to the frankly just bizarre. A parent in Texas decided to take his clothes off to argue in favor of keeping masks on in schools. I got over here to the school today and the parking lot's full and I decided I was going to park wherever the hell I want to, which in this case happened to be a uh, handicap. Okay, so that man, and we'll keep the video up, is going to strip to his underwear at a heated school board meeting near Austin. He compared requiring masks to having to follow other rules, like wearing clothes at work or following the speed limit. You can see the police officers want him to put his clothes back on. In Northern California, the police also got involved. They say a father assaulted a teacher who stepped in during a dispute with a principal over mask rules at an elementary school. The teacher reportedly had lacerations bruising and was even taken to the hospital. The parent is now facing misdemeanor charges. Joining us now, Tori Gibson, superintendent of the Amador County, California School District, where this happened. We also reached out to the parent in the incident, but have not heard back. Uh, Tori, thank you for joining us. We appreciate this. Uh, I know you're up by Sacramento. Uh, how did this start? What happened? It all began when the student and a the principal exited the building um, from the office. Dad was coming to pick her up. He was running just a little bit late, you know, during pickup time, which, you know, it happens. And um, our California rule is when, when it comes to mask mandates and requirements, talks about when students are not present on campus, student, sorry, staff who are vaccinated are allowed to remove their masks indoors. And when he walked up to the office as she exited with the principal, they both had their masks on. And he saw in the teacher lounge, um, a few teachers standing indoors with the door open, um, not wearing a mask. And he became outraged. He you know, verbally assaulted the, the principal at that point. They left. Um, he ended up coming back about 45 minutes later where um, then he confronted the principal. A teacher saw him confronting, you know, going into the office to confront her. and knew she was alone in the office, followed in, and um, things transpired. Really, really scary. Have you guys had other incidents of parents being really angry about this? Is, there, is this sort of a brewing fight in your school district over masks? We did. Um, you know, we've had a couple contentious board meetings. Um, definitely not like the one we just saw. But Every, everybody kept the clothes on in your board meeting? Yes, oh, thankfully. Well, okay, that's a start. <laughs> um, but definitely loud. I mean, people are definitely loud about the mask mandate. I'll tell you, we're now in week two. Of, we are exactly on the two-week mark of school today. And things have definitely died down um, considerably. I think, you know, parents are seeing the importance of it now. And even though they're not enjoying their children having to wear a mask, kids are just really happy to be back. I want to say, you're... You're just following the rules of the state, as I understand it. This isn't a, a school district decision. This is a statewide decision, correct? 
Correct. Okay, so I'm wondering, is a superintendent, is, and I know that you don't have to make this decision, but is there a balance between kids not having to wear masks so that they can see people's expressions and get that feedback, especially for elementary kids, and have that social interaction versus whatever protection masks provide? Yeah, I think there is a fine balance. Um, the one thing for us in California is that if, if people are outdoors, they can turn them, they can definitely um, have their masks off. That's not a problem. So a lot of our teachers and classrooms um, have built those outdoor classroom spaces for students. Really? That's and amazing. So, that, so teachers are taking their classes outside or put benches out so everybody can be outside without their masks on? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Oh, wow. okay. So you know we've had a lot of wildfires in our area and smoke so that's been a little bit of a challenge with rough you know smoky not good air quality days so you know but i would say at the end of the day again kids just want to be at school so yeah. we're we're making it work well tori we appreciate you coming and, and talking to us sorry it was under these circumstances hopefully everybody keeps their clothes on at future board meetings for you and uh take care out there all right Thank you. I'm on my way to a board meeting now, so I'll cross my fingers. All right. Well, re report back if anybody takes clothes off, all right? I will, for sure. Right. <laughs> Thank we'll, you. We'll be right back. Today in 1944, American troops rolled into Paris for a parade after the Nazis surrendered the capital. Grateful crowds met the GIs with flowers and wine, thanking them for liberation from the Nazis. Of course, there was a lot of fighting to come, but the tide of the war had fully changed. Among those on the streets of Paris that day was Major Henry Holt with Eisenhower's staff. Here he is soon after at Allied headquarters. I still have his war trunk in my bedroom. He, like so many of the greatest generation, never talked about the war or their experiences. Sadly, the American troops in Kabul right now face a very different situation, both at home and on the battlefield, than those who drove the Nazis from Europe do. But it shouldn't make us any less grateful for their service or their sacrifice. Next time you see someone who served in what is now America's longest war, remember the disgrace the past few weeks is especially hard on them. And an encouraging word means a lot. That's it for tonight. Marnie's here with Prime.